So, first of all, sorry for making you wait so long. Um, I'm going to present our speakers uh, in details later, but I just want to welcome uh, Tiziana Filewska and William Bleicher uh, to the stage. Uh, I'm going to make a short uh, introduction, uh, and then the plan is we have a, a, just a short movie as well, that, well, a film, YouTube video, and then we're going to start the actual discussion and Q&A. So throughout the, the whole event, start thinking about what questions you might want to ask and thinking of the topics that interest you and that the speakers could provide some answers. <laughs> so as you, as you all know, uh, Ukraine is at war. Uh, the full-scale invasion started on the 24th of February, but the war has started much earlier in 2014. It's been more than eight years now. And while we all see the news from the battlefront, uh, sometimes it's very tragic and sad news, sometimes it's better news, like the liberation of her son recently, uh, there is also another war, and it is the war on the cultural front. And this war has also been fought for, for many, many years, if not decades or centuries. And so today we want to, uh, we want to discuss this cultural side and our topic for the event is why Russia is so afraid of Ukrainian culture. So to start off, to start off, we just want to give you a bit of context on the situation uh, around cultural heritage in Ukraine, specifically in the war. So it's going to cover mostly uh, recent events, but then we will be able to expand on the more historical aspects because, uh, well, we'll discover that Russia is afraid of Ukrainian culture not for one, eight months, eight years, but for much, much longer. And it's a long historical legacy. Sound? Stained glass in churches is being boarded up and precious artifacts are being moved to safer locations. While Russia's war against Ukraine is now mainly concentrated in the country's eastern region, historical buildings and other sites of cultural significance have become another front in the war. Indiscriminate attacks throughout Ukraine have damaged or destroyed hundreds of cultural sites by some counts. And in Ukrainian areas recently occupied by Russia, experts say another kind of cultural destruction is taking place with attempts by Russia to exert greater political and economic influence in the areas. Together with our partners at Bellingcat, Newsy has analyzed three incidents in which Ukrainian cultural sites were damaged or destroyed during the Russian invasion, something that, if done intentionally, could constitute a war crime. In the lead-up to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, President Vladimir Putin gave a speech to the Russian nation. In it, he denied that Ukraine was ever a real independent nation. That caused concern for many in Ukraine and internationally over what this meant for Ukraine's culture and heritage were Russia to invade. This includes Alessia ostrovska Liuta, the director of the Art Arsenal Cultural Center in Kiev. We clearly see that there is, uh, there is a, a plan to erase um, Ukrainian identity, Ukrainian culture, if needed, together with Ukrainians physically, to um, get rid of anything which makes Ukrainian otherness from, uh, from Russia. While it's difficult to assign intent, the sheer number of Ukraine's cultural sites that have been damaged or destroyed, from museums dedicated to Enlightenment-era philosophers to 16th century monasteries, shows that they are at the very least not being excluded from Russia's indiscriminate bombing of Ukraine's population. Working with Bellingcat and using open source information, we identified multiple sites which were heavily damaged by either airstrikes, artillery fire, or small arms fire. Each was in the territory controlled by Ukraine's government at the time it was attacked. There are many more cases than just these. On the evening of March 12th, the historic Spiato Hirsch Lavra Monastery was struck with what witnesses say was an airstrike. <laughs> Был нанесен авиационный удар. Бомба 
упала непосредственно рядом возле моста, который соединяет. Video from the evening and the next day show that the monastery's buildings nearest to a bridge spanning the Donets River that connects to the monastery received the most damage. Images and videos shared by the monastery show that the windows in buildings as far away as 270 meters were damaged by the blast. The monastery is hundreds of years old and considered a major Orthodox Christian religious site in Ukraine. At the time it was bombed, more than 500 refugees from other parts of Ukraine were staying in its buildings. The monastery says that there was no military equipment on the complex grounds. While witnesses say the damage was the result of an airstrike, there's no weapon remnants or craters visible in the imagery online, so it's difficult to verify the claim. A group of pine trees near where the majority of the damage was caused are missing their tops and appear to be burned, suggesting that the trees may have detonated whatever munition was used. A month after the attack, a Russian general said on state-run media that Ukrainian forces had placed weapon systems in the region of the monastery, though there's no evidence to back up this claim. More religious buildings associated with the monastery were shelled two months later in May. Another cultural site was damaged ten days later, on March 23rd, in the besieged city of Mariupol. The Quinji Art Museum, dedicated to Ukrainian Greek artist Arhip Quinji, known for his realist paintings, was destroyed by a Russian bomb, according to the Mariupol City Council. Planet satellite imagery shows that the museum building, while damaged, was not completely razed. A month later, Russian news channels conducted interviews from the Quinji Museum and showed at least one piece of Quinji's art, apparently hidden by the director. A handwritten sign on the front door declared the museum was now controlled by pro-Russian separatists. Damage to the museum consists primarily of a large hole seen in the side of the building, as well as the majority of the building's roof being destroyed. The Frikori Skoboroda National Literary Memorial Museum, located about 40 kilometers outside of Kharkiv, was destroyed the night of May 7th. Video showed the museum, which is at the historic home of the 18th century Ukrainian poet and philosopher, on fire late in the evening. State emergency services for the region were able to put the fire out, but not before the building was severely damaged. According to witnesses, as well as Ukraine's national police in the Kharkiv region, the fire started after the museum was hit with a Russian artillery strike. One security guard was injured in the attack, and the museum's deputy director for research said on Facebook that part of the exhibits that were on display were taken out of the building before the strike. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky referenced the museum attack in an evening address. These kinds of attacks aren't the only threats to Ukraine's cultural heritage. There's another type of cultural erasure that comes from the building of Russian-themed monuments in occupied territory, or even by switching the local currency to Russia's ruble. A paper published in the Small Wars Journal in January, before the invasion, found dozens of examples where new monuments were constructed on the Crimean Peninsula and separatist-controlled Donbass region in eastern Ukraine since 2014, when the conflict between Russia and Ukraine began. This gives a glimpse of what may be in store in newly occupied regions of Ukraine. In fact, it's already starting to happen in the occupied Kherson region, which Russia is trying to switch to using Russia's currency over Ukraine's. Statues of Vladimir Lenin and Soviet flags are also starting to appear in cities under control of Russian forces as well. Ukraine has thousands of cultural sites. Getting an exact number is difficult due to differing definitions of what actually constitutes a site of heritage or culture. One count from the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative puts the number at more than 28,000. Using that metric means there's a lot of potential for sites to be damaged. Ukraine's Ministry of Culture is keeping count of how many cultural heritage sites have been damaged or destroyed. So far, they've counted more than 300 incidents. So, this is the video that gives you a, a bit of context, but obviously doesn't cover all the war crimes that have been committed by the terrorist Russian state against Ukraine, against Ukrainian culture, and against Ukrainian people. Uh, now, 
obviously Ukrainian culture is a, a very wide concept which we could debate for hours on what it includes, what it means. Uh, and it's obviously a, a, a concept which fluctuates and we can rediscover it over and over. But, but today we're pleased to have our guests uh, who I will introduce to you now and I will read just not to forget any of the exciting facts about them. Uh, Tatiana Filevska uh, is the creative director of the Ukrainian Institute, but not the one in London. There is another Ukrainian Institute in Kiev uh, who is in charge of, uh, who does cultural diplomacy. And, and Ukraine's cultural, uh, she's also an art manager, a curator and a writer. Her background is in philosophy with experience in contemporary art and Ukrainian art history of the 20th century. Uh, and as you can see on the screen, she's the author of the books Kazimir Malevich, Kiev period, 1928-1930, Kazimir Malevich, Kiev aspect, and Dmitro Gorbachev, Sluche. Uh, she worked in various art institutions in Ukraine uh, and is creating a public program of the Ukrainian pavilion at the 59th Venice Biennale, dedicated to decolonization, a topic which I think we will raise tonight as well. Um, William Blacker, uh, Associate Professor in Ukrainian and East European Culture here at UCL, School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies, which is next door, um, it, with a research focus on cultural memory in East Central Europe. He's the author of Memory, the City and the Legacy of World War II in East Central Europe. He has translated the work of many Ukrainian authors, including Oleg Sensov short story collection Life Went On Anyway, he has written for The Atlantic, The Times Literary Supplement, and The Literary Review, among others, of course. Uh, in 2022, he was Paul Salen Translation Fellow at the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna. So, that said, I would like to finally give the floor to our speakers. Uh, I'm sure you all came to listen to them, not me. Um, and we would like to start by uh, short presentation from both of our speakers and uh, I would like to invite Tiana uh, first and we will hear some more of interesting case studies. Thank you. Thank you Anton for inviting and organizing this event and thank you all for coming and those who will watch it online as a record. Thank you for giving your attention and time. Um, it's a very important topic to, to raise uh, about culture during the war because as we have seen uh, from the past eight months, um, culture is definitely a target for Russians in this war. And uh, what was already proven by the video that we were just shown and uh, um, many other evidence that we will touch uh, upon today. Uh, I just wanted to make a little notice that in the video it tells that there are around 300 um, uh, her cultural heritage objects destroyed uh, uh, according to the Ministry of, of, of Culture. Now the number is around 500 already and it's raising and uh, uh, we also do our kind of public record of those losses. It's the, the project that's called Posters from Ukraine and on our website we have stories about prominent objects showing how they were, how they looked like before the invasion started and what happened to them afterwards. So you're all welcome to discover uh, more about these uh, objects. Just if I may, we will include all the links or videos we are showing or talking about today in a follow-up and we'll share with you. Yeah, so... Uh, Asking yourself a question, why is Russia so afraid of Ukrainian culture? I have found five uh, answers for myself and I would like to share it with you and looking forward to hear the answers that William was able to find for himself. Um, one of the things that, um, that um, I wanted to share with you uh, regarding my own practice is uh, Kazimir Malevich that was already mentioned as my of main focus of interest for, for interest for the last years. And um, before I started doing my research something like 10 years ago, um, and no one actually knew anything about Kazimir Malevich in regards to Ukraine. 
Uh, it was just the fact that he was born in Kiev, which happened to be something accidental, with no real connection. Um, when I learned about that, even the fact that he was born in Kiev, I, I realized that um, I was just curious, you know, how the fact that he was born here ha might have any influence on in that. And I started my own research, and it ended up um, in years of research. Uh, and I was lucky to find something new uh, and important. And this was an archive that was dedicated to Malevich's work in Kiev in late 20s, when he was already a known professor. And he was te invited to teach at the Kiev Art Institute, where he was actually reforming the art education system. And how this, uh, this is how this book came to life, because it was a collection of all the materials that relate Malevich to Kiev in this particular period. But then I didn't stop. I moved on organizing conferences and gathering more people who were interested in the topic. And we ended up um, uh, publishing the second book, which uh, refers to other connections uh, Malevich had to Ukraine. So um, after several years of this intense work, I um, ended up being accused by Russian um, colleagues and Russian media on stealing Malevich from Russia. Um, <laughs> and uh, trying to kind of uh, um, tear Malevich between, you know, different countries. Which for me makes no sense because uh, I think complex identity is something that 20th century introduced to the world and it's okay being, you know, uh, of different cultures and um, kind of sharing this uh, identity, your, yeah, your identity between different cultures. But this seems not to be the Russia's case. Russia wants to appropriate everything, yeah, and it doesn't want to share. So one of the things that why they are afraid of Ukrainian culture is that they will have to share so much because Russian Empire for centuries would appropriate and would exhaust resources, including talent, talents and people, from all the former colonies, dragging Malevich, dragging um, uh, Borknyansky dragging many different artists and musicians, Grigory Skovorda, which was already mentioned, and forcing them to go to Moscow or St. Petersburg because these were the only places that they could receive their education uh, at or uh, actually build their careers. So, um, uh, for centuries, they would loot, appropriate, and exhaust Ukrainian culture, include and also other cultures, and. Um, what Ukraine was left with was just folklore culture or like folk culture or uh, food, for example, yeah, culinary. This, is what, this was the only allowed type of culture. So we were not supposed to have our own sophisticated, developed, uh, important culture on our own. Um, the second, uh, my second point would be that um, Ukrainian culture definitely works to destroy the myth of Russian Ruski Mir, Russian world, yeah, so-called. Ruski Mir is the central idea to the Russian Empire. It was there for from 18th century on. And uh, um, Ukrainian culture is um, and one of these ideas uh, of Ruski Mir is that Ru Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian, Belarusian people are like the same people, and there is no division between us. And uh, um, uh, Ukrainian culture proves it's not. It says that they are different people, uh, there are different languages, and the idea of Ruski Mir is not as as kind of uh, obvious as Russians pretend to 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 have it. And uh, uh, it's curious why they. Um, uh, targeted this particular museum of Rivoris Kvarda, which, according to Russian um, uh, Russian tradition, counts to be one of the first philosophers of Russia, and he is kind of uh, the founder of the Russian philosophical tradition. Uh, but as we already know, they are not ready to share, and they are not ready to recognize that um, uh, you know. They, there is something from another culture that they are dependent on and um, something that was there before there was Russian. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, Ukrainian culture proves that uh, the notion of great Russian culture is fake. Because uh, Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian art history shows that 
Russia was always an aggressive state um, and occupying power incapable of producing the senses for the future. And in, in, um, in, in, in contrary, we see Russian, uh, Russia being um, aggressive and uh, committing genocidal crimes against Ukraine and Ukrainian culture for centuries. Um, on this photograph, you can see uh, a wood somewhere in the north far Russia. It's some darmoch. It's a, a kahis, a forest, where uh, um, on five days in late October, early November um, 1937, uh, the whole generation of Ukrainian artists was physically uh, executed. Uh, there was a huge number, hundreds of artists, writers, directors, uh, that were shot sometimes two people with one bullet because bullets were more precious for uh, Bolsheviks, for Russians, than people. So they would save bullets, killing uh, two people with one. Um, there are no graves, and just recently these uh, mass burials were discovered, and you can see this kind of symbolic um, trees as graves for these uh, prominent artists of the 20th century from Ukraine. By eliminating these people and also the memory of these people, Russia wanted to produce the myth of the great Russian culture being uh, a very kind of um, humanistic tradition, while the nature of it is genocidal uh, crime. The next, please. I want to finish with something positive. I understand it's quite um, dark uh, until now. But um, Ukrainian culture is definitely empowering um, and state in the agency of sovereign Ukrainian state. And this, is, this was very clear from the statement that Putin made on the eve of the invasion. And um, sometimes uh, they call Ukraine as anti-Russia. Mm -hmm. And they fear this spirit of freedom and sovereignty that there is and there was always in Ukraine. And <coughs> they understand that existence of Ukrainian state and Ukrainian uh, sovereignty really endangers the existence of authoritarian Russian regime. And it means that if Ukraine exists, Russia can no longer stay in imperial power. And I think that democracy and Russia are things that we'll never need on Earth because democracy means collapse of Russia. Um, on this photograph, you can see an exhibition that took place um, very recently in August, and this these are the um, paintings, the, the works of Maria Primachenko, Ukraine's famous um, naive artist of the beginning of 20th century. These artworks were kept in the um, museum in Ivankiv, in the Kiev region. And um, uh, this, that was a gift of the family uh, to the museum where actually the artist lived for, for all her life. Um, on the second day of the invasion, the museum was bombed and it burned down completely. And two people, security guys that were there, they went into the burning museum and took away the paintings. Uh, so the exhibition was open during the invasion, you know, um, and there were huge lines in the city, in the capital, while the uh, anti art air uh, sirens would go on a few days, um, a few um, hours, a few hours a day. And proving again, you know, that Ukrainians are, uh, culture is important for Ukrainians. And, uh, you know, the sense of um, danger doesn't stop them from going and looking at art uh, that was saved during this war. Um, yeah, so I think culture, Ukrainian culture is definitely part of our resistance. It's definitely a source of inspiration and support and meaning for this, uh, for, for our resistance and for our fight in this war. Uh, and this is definitely something that uh, frightens Russia. These were my five points. Thank you, Tatiana. <laughs> now, I, <laughs> now I'd like to invite uh, William Blecker. Uh, and we'll hear more about literature because this is the expertise. Okay, thank you so much, um, Anton, for the invitation and uh, for this really interesting presentation. Um, and I'm going to say some kind of similar things actually, but coming from a different angle. Um, so I'm not talking about maybe physical destruction of culture, cultural objects as such, or art, but I'm going to talk about literature. 
Um, I'm going to talk about censorship. Because I think if we want to understand this question, like what, what is Russia, why is Russia afraid of Ukrainian culture, uh, it's useful to look at censorship because censorship tells us what the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, wanted to remove from Ukrainian culture. What parts of it were seen as too dangerous for people to consume? Um, uh, which might, which parts of it um, were seen as a threat to whatever the imperial order or the Soviet ideological order. Um, and I'll start off, and I'll talk about two, basically, two of the, the main canonical writers in the Ukrainian canon, so Shevchenko, the national poet, and Leslie Ukrainka, who's probably like behind Shevchenko number two in the national canon of Ukrainian culture. Those of you from Ukraine, I'm sure, know this very well, but uh, probably not all of you do. Um, so Shevchenko, again, I think there are quite a few Ukrainians in the room, and you'll know this story very well, but I'll say a few words about him just for those who don't. Um, so he is the uh, national poet. He, was, he has a very remarkable road to becoming the national poet. Um, a very unlikely, it's a very unlikely story. So he's born a serf, so he's the legal property of another person. Uh, he's born into a very poor family, he's orphaned at a very young age, but his owner uh, noticed when he was a child that he had some artistic talents. Uh, and when he was a teenager, young man, he decided to take uh, his uh, self, who was uh, working as his servant, domestic servant, to St. Petersburg and train him up as an artist. Um, basically with, with, the, with the aim of having his own private personal artist. His, uh, in his household. Um, Shevchenko, uh, to cut a long story short, Shevchenko eventually makes a lot of friends in the artistic circles in St. Petersburg, among the intelligentsia, uh, and manages to raise enough money to buy his own freedom, which is, for the vast, vast majority of serfs was completely impossible and unthinkable, so there was a lot of money. Um, but through connections with, through the Imperial Academy of Arts, through well-connected and rich artists and their clients, the money was raised. Uh, so he becomes an artist and he also starts to write. Because when he's in St. Petersburg, he starts to read uh, what people are reading in St. Petersburg. So he's reading Russian literature and European literature, but also what Ukrainian writers are writing. Because there are Ukrainian writers writing in Ukrainian in, in St. Petersburg. Um, it was a kind of unusual choice because the literary language, the language of high culture and the Russian Empire was obviously Russian. Uh, and Ukrainian was a peasant dialect, basically. That's how it was viewed. And if you were writing in this language, you were basically doing it as a kind of ethnographic exercise. Uh, it wasn't serious literature. Um, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't produce high culture, high poetry in this language. You know, it, it, it's a kind of, it, would be, it would be a kind of absurd idea. Uh, so a lot of the, the literature in Ukrainian that he was encountering was this kind of stylized on folk ballads and folk songs. And, and the writers were often collecting this stuff as well. They were kind of um, folklorists as well as writers. What he does is something a bit different. So he publishes his first book in 1840 uh, called Kobzar. So Kobzar is a person who plays on this uh, uh, national uh, instrument. Um, yeah, can you go back and back? Um, yeah. Uh, this, this instrument, this kind of folk instrument, you know, which, which accompanies the kind of folk ballads. Um, it's a short book, first edition, 116 pages. Um, but, and it kind of, everything in at this time, the Russian Empire goes through the censorship. Censorship is very strict. Um, it kind of goes under the radar initially, because this is a, an unknown poet who's writing in this obscure language. It's not seen as something that's you know, worthy of a lot of attention. It doesn't get heavily censored in its first version. However, it immediately becomes very popular, especially among this Ukrainian intelligence. Um, and people start to pay attention. And the Russian critics and the Russian censors start to pay attention. So like, what's, what's going on with this, this Shevchenko, um, this very unusual cultural figure, this you know, some very unlikely writer who's writing this um, poetry that's making this you know, uh, became a splash. So why, why did it become so important? Why was it so interesting? Why was it kind of controversial a little bit? Well, he, he wasn't sticking within this folkloristic, ethnographic, um, framework exactly. He was writing poetry that had, that expressed a very clear vision of Ukrainian history, which was different to the imperial history, so that was the first thing. Um, and it also explored, I, you know, it had this kind of ph philosophical ideas that it was exploring. Freedom, the main, main thing, the nature of freedom, the importance of freedom, 
um, uh, the opposition of freedom and tyranny. Uh, and this was very exciting, very interesting to the, to the readers, especially to the Ukrainian intelligentsia. But, and it got the Russian literary establishment, let's say, a little bit concerned. Yeah, so next slide, please. So one of the first um, reviews of Shevchenko's work was written by Vyselin Belinsky, who, if you know your Russian intellectual history, is a, a giant of Russian intellectual history, um, and not seen as a you know, kind of nationalist or reactionary or an imperialist, uh, very much a westernizer, a progressive figure in Russian thought, someone who was opposed to serfdom, for example. Yeah. But his view of Ukrainian, that this kind of mm, tolerant progressive view doesn't really extend to people writing poetry in the Ukrainian language. Um, so as you can see, uh, the, first, the first quote is not from the review, but this is a view of, uh, of Russian history. So history of Russia's attributed to the great river Russian history, kind of similar to what we heard Putin say in that video um, just a few minutes ago. Uh, and in the review, he talks about so-called Russian literature, so you know, it's, it's kind of, can you even call it literature, uh, as opposed to some kind of you know, folklore. Um, and he talks about the language in the poetry being, on the one hand, very vulgar, um, but on the other hand, not being comprehensible to ordinary people, because it was kind of too fancy and complicated at the same time. And the idea was that there's no point in writing like this. For, because the only people who can read this are simple peasants who won't understand any, anything sophisticated. So there's this kind of weird circular logic. So, you know, Ukraine is a peasant language, so you can't write sophisticated poetry in this language. Therefore, a priori, if you do write that poetry, it's a failure from the beginning. It can't not be a failure, because it's pointless. Um, and he sort of says, you know, they should stick to maybe writing socially useful uh, uh, kind of text to, to teach the peasants something, something useful. Um, but what we see here underneath this, uh, I mean, in the, in the, the whole review is very, very sarcastic. He kind of repeats the Ukrainian words in this very sarcastic way, kind of in, in inverted commas, as if they're funny. Um, you know, one wonders how much he actually understood uh, as well. Um, but underneath it all, I think you can feel fear. We're talking about what, what's the, the fear of, of Ukrainian culture. Uh, he seems to protest a little bit too much. Why is he so annoyed with this? And it's not, and he, there's several texts that Blinsky writes where he really kind of objects to the very existence of Ukrainian culture. So why is he so annoyed? Well, at this time, we're talking about the context of the 1830s, 1840s. Uh, Russian literature itself is looking for its identity. Russian literature is comparing itself to French literature and English literature and German literature, and it doesn't look very favorable. Yeah? The reading public in Russia is very, very, very small. The level of literacy is very low. The number of important writers is also very small. You know, it's, it's a big, big empire with a small literature. It doesn't feel very confident. But it's trying to pass itself off as this high culture of a, of a big, important, powerful state. Um, and you can see that kind of, there's a little bit of a you know, cultural complex uh, underlying this. Because if the Ukrainians, who are not even a people, and never had a state, start writing poetry that's kind of interesting and sophisticated, then what does that say about us? You know? So it starts to make them feel kind of nervous. Okay, I'll come, I'll come back to this in a while. Um, it also makes the censors a little bit nervous. So next. So the, the first edition, as I said, came out in 116 pages. All the, the, the next editions came out in 106, because it made 10 pages of cuts. Um, that was quite light censorship compared to future decades, uh, future um, editions. The, um, and, and there were in the 1840s, and then uh, throughout the 19th century, there were various editions of Shevchenko that come out in the Russian Empire. And they're all heavily, heavily centered. Um, at some points, you know, there's a poem, very famous poem by Shevchenko called Testament, which is 24 lines long. And there's a, an, an 1890s edition, which uh, has only the first four lines, and the rest is, is centers, um, cuts. Yeah, so it's kind of uh, 
very, very serious uh, cuts to all the poems. At one point, he gets um, an edition of his work back, and he says, I don't even recognize my own poetry. And he calls his, his poems my children. I don't even understand. I don't even recognize them anymore, because they've been so butchered by the, the censor. So what did the censor cut out? So people who have studied this in depth, and I haven't, but I've read what they wrote, um, have identified kind of three main areas. So anything that criticizes the empire and the power specifically is, is cut out. Anything that criticizes the Orthodox Church is censored. Uh, and anything that says that Ukraine is somehow some kind of separate entity, historically, culturally, is censored. Uh, and this kind of very interestingly maps onto official Russian ideology of the time. So um, in the 1830s, the empire develops this idea of the Russian national idea and Russian, Russian national identity, which is based on three pillars, um, which are autocracy, orthodoxy, and nationality. So when we study Russian cultural history, we'll, we'll learn about this. Uh, autocracy, the rule of the Tsar, orthodoxy, the Russian Orthodox Church, and nationality is it's a kind of this is the more complicated one. There's this kind of all-encompassing Russian identity, uh, national identity, which is able to kind of absorb all the uh, smaller cultures and nations in, uh, underneath its umbrella. And all of the thick on each of these points, which are really the, you know the pillars that are, are are used to hold up this new vision of Russian culture, Shevchenko is attacking each one of them. Uh, so again, and this phrase anti-Russia that Putin used, it's kind of very interesting here. What, what's been posited as Russia, each one of those, Shevchenko is against them. Yeah, so there's, there's, you know, there's, something, there's something in that. Uh, and just as an example, so this is one, one, one of his very famous poems, uh, which is very long, titled To My Compatriots Living Dead and Unborn in Ukraine and Outside of My Friendly Epistle, that's the full title. Uh, and he has this line which says, talking to his compatriots, so your father spilled their blood for Moscow and Warsaw, and all they got was chains. Yeah, all they inherited were chains. Um, this is censored, obviously. Um, in, by the 1840s, Shevchenko becomes a little bit more radical, because he goes back to Ukraine and he sees the, the conditions that people live in. Uh, his own brothers and sisters are still living in serfdom. Uh, he, and he starts to write more critical poetry. Uh, he kind of moves away from the historical and folklore influences and he starts writing contemporary political satire, contemporary critiques of uh, Russian imperialism. Uh, so poems like, for example, the Caucasus, one of his most famous, which is, a, is not about Ukraine, but it's the defense of the Muslim peoples of the Caucasus who have been, uh, who have been you know, oppressed and attacked by the Russian Empire for, for decades uh, already, um, inspired by the death of one of his friends uh, in, in the army. In, in the Russian army. Um, and a, a very, very unusual thing to encounter in, in this, the, the kind of literature of the Russian Empire at the time, if we can include it into that. You know, a writer coming and openly objecting not only to Russian imperialism, but also sort of predict, uh, defending uh, a Muslim uh, minority against it. Yeah? It's, it's very hard to find uh, anything in, in Russian literature compared to. These were not, these were never intended for publication. He knew that they would be published. They were circulated in manuscript form uh, among uh, sort of Ukrainian intelligence circles. But they were discovered by the police. Shevchenko was arrested, uh, and he was sent, uh, he was sentenced to 10 years of, of military exile. So he served uh, mostly in Central Asia. And he was banned from writing and painting. And the, the provision that he should not be allowed to write or paint was added by the Tsar in his own hand. That is how strongly he felt about it. Um, the, when he comes back, he tries to get his works published, but still lots of problems with the censor. The first uncensored collection of his poems comes out in Prague in 1876. That's already some years after he's died. Um, and then in Ukraine, the first time his works are published on uncensored is after 1917 when you have this short period of Ukrainian independence. And so this short kind of shaky period when Ukraine is an independent state. Uh, and they print a lot of Shevchenko in those short years. Uh, I think I read some of something like seven, three million books uh, they managed to publish. But in, 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 this is also going into the 20s, so right into the Soviet period as well. 
Um, but then you see, very interestingly, after the end of the 20s, when Stalinism comes in the 1930s, uh, the Soviet censors start going into the libraries and taking all of those books out, uh, removing them, destroying them. And they start to re republish Shevchenko, once again censored, in pretty much the same way as he was being censored under uh, the Soviet Union. So again, taking away references, you know, un uh, unfavorable references to Russia especially. He could criticize the Tsar, because yeah, the Soviet Union was opposing itself to the Tsar. But it couldn't, it, but it had to be framed in terms of this kind of class uh, conflict and not a national conflict. And there's a lot of national conflict in, in Shevchenko. So again, there's a lot of censorship. Um, so, and then, you know, they would do things, for example, a slightly different question, but when they translated Shevchenko into, into Russian, you would have things where they would replace uh, Moskali, which is a word that he often used about Russians, uh, with uh, Tatar, for example, the, the, with the Tatars. Yeah? So the, the Cossacks are not fighting the, the, the Russians, they're actually fighting the Tatars. The, you know, these, these kind of substitutions were made. Um, okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and the, the, again, the, there's a there's a different version of Shevchenko that comes out, but it's it, but it's equally kind of distorted by censorship. And you can see there that just in case any impressionable readers might be led astray by things Shevchenko wrote about Ukrainian history, this is from a Soviet introdu introduction to his works in 1949. Uh, Shevchenko unfortunately didn't understand all the questions of history, uh, especially those between Russia and Ukraine. Um, but. Lenin and Stalin have been defending Shevchenko even since before the revolution from all these misreadings of him by bourgeois nationalists, I, I, by Ukraine. Uh, so just in case you guys didn't know, Stalin was defending Shevchenko from, from Ukraine. Um, okay, let's see the next, next slide. So the, the next... <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> there was supposed to be a different picture, but... Uh, that's fine, that's fine. Um, the... So as I said, uh, Les Ukrenka is probably number two in the, in the literary canon behind Shevchenko. She comes uh, after, uh, she's, a, she's a later generation, she's working the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Um, and she is kind of suffers from what happened after Shevchenko, basically. You had this, the, the emergence of this very self-assertive, very kind of fiery nationalistic uh, literature. In, in, in the shape of Shevchenko. Uh, and after that, the Russian Empire was much more strict with the censorship. Especially going into the 1860s, 1870s, there are various prohibitions and bans on what you can write and print and perform uh, in, in Ukrainian. So most, uh, she basically during her career has to publish most of her stuff abroad, not, not in Russian. So she's send, sending her work to uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian lands that are in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so it can be to be published. Um, and her life, her early life, is really shaped by this repressive atmosphere. So if you, you and I look at these women, and we probably think these are kind of nice, uh, polite, sort of Victorian Edwardian uh, ladies, <coughs> middle-class ladies, um, but if you are the Tsarist police, or even later on, the NKVD, you look at these women and you see something very terrifying. Uh, you see uh, women who are culturally active, politically active, uh, and subversive. And all of these women in these photos have been, were arrested at some point. And there was supposed to be another one who was also arrested, but uh, we, we didn't have the photo. It's okay. It's okay. Um, so in the, uh, Lesio Karinka, this is the pseudonym, her name is Larissa Kosac, she's a, she is, yeah, something went wrong with the, with the inscriptions here. Uh, she's the one in the middle. Uh, this, this is her mother, Elena Ptilka, who was also a, a writer. Her, her name was Olga Kosac. Uh, Lesia and her sister here, and Lesia's aunt, um, uh, Elena Kosac. <coughs> She wrote her first poem when she was nine years, nine years old after her aunt was arrested by the Zionist police uh, and given a 10-year sentence for revolutionary activity. She herself, along with her sister, was also arrested at some point, but not, not charged. Uh, her mother was arrested 
already after she died by the uh, Soviet police. Uh, her younger sister was arrested already in 1930, I think, uh, by the Soviet police and sent to the Gulag. Her husband went on to work in the Soviet Union. He was also arrested and repressed. Uh, so it's, it's a family which, whose existence was defined by arrests and oppression un, uh, under, under the Tsar and under the, the commissars as well. Um, so let's look at censorship. Well, in some ways the question is kind of is slightly different because it was just like for a lot of the time impossible for her to publish anything. It had to be sent abroad and then often smuggled back into the Russian Empire. Um, her next her most important works <coughs> are dramas. So she wrote uh, several modernist dramas, which are they're, they're kind of defined by their modernism, their feminism, and their anti-imperialism. Uh, often she takes these kind of uh, classical subjects or biblical subjects and turns them into allegories for Ukraine under Russian rule, the oppression of Ukrainian culture. And she, and she pretty much always focuses on the position of women in that situation. And so it's the kind of position of the, the woman under colonial oppression. Uh, the one, uh, and these were almost, all of her plays were performed in the Russian Empire during her lifetime because theater was very strictly controlled, depending on what period you're talking about, either there was a ban on performances or if you had a Ukrainian play, there had to be also a Russian play on the bill. Um, and the Ukrainian plays that were that did exist were basically they had to be about the lives of peasants. Uh, anything else would, be, would not pass the censor. Uh, so basically, everything she wrote didn't fit those kind of plays. This play in particular, this is the only one she wrote about Ukraine and Russia, which was set between Ukraine and Russia. It's set in the seventeenth century when a Ukrainian noble moves to Russia. This is at a time when. Ukraine sort of comes under Russian control. Uh, and the main character is his wife. Uh, so the, the play is called Bogarinia, or the noble woman. And you can see here, published in, this is published in Leipzig, yeah, not, not in the Russian Empire. Uh, and she encounters, uh, it, it basically the, the play draws this very stark distinction between the Ukrainian characters and the Russia that they find when they moved there. So the, she expects it to be not too difficult to make a transition because these are also Orthodox people, the language is, you know, she can understand it. Uh, but when she gets there, she finds that she is uh, not allowed to speak to men. Basically, she's not allowed to leave the house on her own. Uh, and she, even like the way she dresses is kind of policed. Um, so there's this kind of feminist element to it but it's also overlaid onto the anti-imperial element. And then in, in the play, the, the husband is the one who kind of wants to make compromises and accommodation with the empire, and the wife is the one who's warning him against it. Uh, and she says, and this, this is, I think, one of the, the most powerful right, the lines from it, she's saying, and this is after a period of kind of conflict and war. Uh, uh, in Ukraine, she says, Ukraine lies bleeding under Moscow's troops. Is that what you call peace or ruined waste? And it's a line that you can almost hear people saying today when you know, we talk about the, uh, when Ukraine's been pushed towards uh, compromises and, and negotiations and so on. Um, this also has a similar, all this also has a similar afterlife in the Soviet Union, as Shevchenko did. Um, so if we look at the uh, editions of Lesya Ukrenka's work, which came out in the Soviet Union, and she was also, because she was a Marxist, uh, she was a socialist, she was included into the Soviet canon, but in a very, very distorted way. Uh, so they went through her works and her collected, collected works, which include letters, for example. Uh, everything about feminism is taken out. Everything, of course, anti-imperial is taken out, or anti-Russian is taken out. Um, and so strong expressions of Ukrainian against the are, are taken out. This play is entirely limited. Um, and it doesn't, it, it has some editions in the late 1920s, um, but then it's not published in Ukraine until the 1990s. 
um, because you have this image of uh, Ukraine as in historical conflict with Russia, as historically distinct from Russia, with its own separate identity, with its own culture, with its own social norms and, and gender norms as well, um, in opposition to an oppressive uh, and, um, uh, and violent and brutal uh, Russia. Yeah, so that's basically there's there's no way that you could censor this and cover it out to to make it acceptable. So it's uh, it's missing. Okay, so that's kind of just two case studies. There, you know, we could take many, many, many case studies, but I think the main thing to take away from it, you know, what what has been censored from <coughs> these works, um, a separate version of Ukrainian history. And Ukrainian history develops separately from Russia. Doesn't come out of Russia or flow into Russian history. It's just accepted uh, that the culture is different. That the culture um, is kind of opposed to autocratic tendencies and totalitarian tendencies. Yeah? So in, in both of these writers, the emphasis on freedom, on resistance to these things, which are so, which have been so important to rule from Moscow. But also, and the final point is what both of them are doing is producing sophisticated, modern, and in both cases at the time it's modern, uh, Ukrainian culture, which is this kind of implicit threat to the cultural superiority that, that Russia uses to define itself in relation to its empire. And so the empire has to have a cultural hierarchy in order for it to exist. And this is all undermining that. So obviously, you know, Ukraine's not an anti-Russia. It wasn't created by anyone as an anti-Russia, but from the point of view of, of Moscow, it, it looks like it, because all of the things that they're using to define their state and their identity are being undermined uh, by these writers, and all of that's been cut out. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for the very insightful presentations, and now I'd like to announce the beginning of our a little discussion Q&A. We as uh, the Ukrainian Society Committee prepared just a couple from ourselves, but then we'll give the floor to you. So, yeah, let's start. So, uh, an, in an interesting point, which we could see both in the video at the beginning, but also in both of your presentation, is that throughout the Imperial Russian, Soviet, and modern Russian uh, periods, um, Ukrainian culture has been subject to executions uh, and censorships in terms of literature, for example, but also destruction and, uh, and damage to the physical uh, cultural heritage. At the same time, the Russian, uh, at the same time, Russia uh, is appropriating some of the Ukrainian culture by rebranding or reshaping the narrative around it. So my question to you, to both of you is, how do you think uh, and why do you think Russia is using both this destruction and damage scheme and appropriation uh, in regards to its fear of Ukrainian culture? Because it seems to me that there's a bit of dissonance in this. Well, William has a, a result. <laughs> and thank you for a wonderful um, a case study. I think I, I haven't... Uh, paid so much attention to those figures since my school time, and I wish I would have such a teacher. <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, it's just thought-provoking. It just breaks all your uh, images, because my school years were just like after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and we didn't still have new approaches in education. So basically, how we were taught was this Soviet approach to Ukrainian history, from where you can feel that it's a minor literature, not interesting, everything is very depressive, no inspiration actually, and very kind of a boring pattern, like everyone has the same matter, biography, etc. So I know so many people who don't like Ukrainian literature because they were taught that it was boring and not interesting, and I'm sure they would be fascinated if, if they would listen to you um, and the way you would teach it. Um, Coming back to your question, why did they do it? I mean, all empires did that to their colonies. Um, that's the typical approach to any kind of sea empires, land empire. 
um, because the idea is to actually neglect the other identity, absorb it, appropriate it, yeah, and um, because culture um, is not something, um, you know, which, uh, which de just decorates or entertains our life. Uh, culture has the power, Pop culture is the strength, it's the place, not the place, but the space where the sense, the meaning is shaped and is preserved and communicated between the generations and between the, the inside the society. So, of course, this strength is something that fears the, uh, the empire. So, uh, it feels that it's the, the power that it needs to kind of oppress, you know, uh, in order to um, eliminate any kind of um, 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 opposition or resistance. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's why they need to kind of either appropriate it or destroy it uh, and forget about it, yeah, so it doesn't have this power anymore. Yeah, I think it's a good point, but um, when, when we talk about this kind of um, violence against Ukrainian culture, it's not only one type of thing, it's not only you know, murdering writers, although that happened a lot. Um, it's, it's a whole range of different practices that constitute this, this whole um, Imperial, imperialist policy towards uh, towards Ukrainian culture. Um, I mean, empires are always about um, appropriation of land, of resources, and also of culture. You know, and, and like you know, and, and like you said, any empire does this, um, and it takes useful cultural things from its peripheries, and it kind of draws them in and changes them and represents them and kind of obscures their origins. Um, and Russia is no, is no different in that sense. Um, and, also, and also empires create a lot of ambiguity um, because you have, um, you always have this hierarchy of cultures, like I was saying, you have this, you have a, a culture of prestige, of power, a language of prestige and of power. And that also attracts people from the from the margins. We know that if they want to be a theatre director or a filmmaker or a writer, they might have to make some kind of accommodation with that culture and with those cultural norms, and they might have to kind of forget a little bit about their origins. You know, so one another writer that I could have spoken about in the nineteenth century is Gogol. Gogol was one who didn't fight against the empire, but who moved to Saint Petersburg and wrote in Russian. But that doesn't mean that he isn't Ukrainian and that he doesn't express Ukrainianness, because I actually think that he really, really does, uh, and he does in very interesting ways and in some sometimes in quite subversive ways. Um, and you can read Gogol in very different ways today. You can read him from the periphery, and you can see a questioning and a kind of ironic subversion of certain things about the empire in his work, or you can read him from the center and just see him as a Russian writer, which he has been seen in Russia for, well, forever, and also in, in the West uh, as just a Russian writer. You know, very, very few people have spoken about Gogol as a Ukrainian writer um, in the West until maybe the last couple of decades, really, you know, like in Western Slavic studies. Uh, so these things, these, this kind of cultural erasure happens in all kinds of complicated ways um, by brute force, but also by other other types of co you know, other types of coercion uh, as well. So it's you know, it's a very yeah it's a very complicated phenomenon. It's also interesting when I uh, when I first heard the question, which Tatiana actually suggested for the for this event, which is why is Russia uh, afraid of Ukrainian culture? I immediately uh, used the approach uh, we were taught at, at university is to dissect the question. And you look at all the key terms. Um, and uh, this term "afraid," I was interested about, and I I, I, I learned that in psychological terms there are diff like there are three main reactions to, to fear, and and uh, and so appropriation uh, and destruction would kind of lie into this concept of fear. Anyways, um, in in with reference to what you mentioned about. Uh, Ukraine culture being as a as a strength of the of the nation and as a threat to the Russian uh, statehood or imperial 
vision of the statehood. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, what would you highlight about Ukrainian culture as its main uh, features uh, that makes it so special and resilient? One or maybe several aspects that, uh, which you could characterize Ukrainian culture. So maybe I'm actually, <laughs> when I'm asking this question, I'm actually thinking about something I read in a, in a, in a recent article of William about Gogol. And um, there was a point about uh, humor and irony, perhaps mockery even. Uh, do you see some, some characteristics like this, or maybe other characteristics in all of Ukrainian culture? Um. Well, first of all, I think I, I would like to say that Ukrainian culture is the uh, um, one of European culture, one of European cultures. It's um, as unique and interesting and solid as any other, and worth um, looking at. So, despite the fact that for centuries it was uh, supposed to feel itself as a minor and some kind of uh, uh, immature or um, inadequate, it is, um, and that's kind of the, the the whole essence of this relationship with Russia. Um, the other thing I would say that um, there are certain features that yeah you can find in Ukrainian literature, visual culture, that make it uh, that make it look different or has its unique. <coughs> signature or um, features. If we speak about visual cul culture, uh, definitely we'll speak about the color, the importance of color and the, uh, the feeling of space that there is in, in the tradition of um, uh, visual artists. Um, but you know, uh, there, is, there, there would be a different, uh, it, that, that would be re relevant, let's say, for the modernist period. But when we look, for example, at the previous periods like Cossack Baroque, we can see some other features there as well. Yeah. Um, so, um, of course, I mean, there are, there are plenty, there are different things. Uh, as you mentioned, humor definitely is one of those, and I think humor is one of these um, resistance strategies that Ukrainians have. I don't think we would be able to go through all this horror of, uh, you know, of these centuries of extinction uh, without uh, being able to laugh at this because we would just be depressed and dead <laughs> by now, I think. Even today, I, I would say that like the Ukrainian memes are just <laughs> elite, elite <laughs> memes. You've all seen at least one of them. Absol <laughs> it's not just Google <laughs> Ukrainian memes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I actually am um, trying to convince one of the Oxford uh, scholars to write a PhD uh, about Ukrainian memes. So I, I really <laughs> take it serious, really. Um, and, you know, and when you look back, and unfortunately, uh, William didn't have time to kind of dive deeper into uh, the history of Ukrainian literature, but our literature actually started with the humor, uh, with the poem of Ivan Kotlarevsky, which is, was a travesty on Aeneid by Virgilius. So it was kind of, you know, start from the starting point, it was about humor and self-irony and ability to, you know, kind of take it easier <laughs> in the in the very kind of hard uh, situation. Um, but yeah, I, I think first of all we have to think that it's one of, of the European cultures that's um, solid and um, interesting on its own. Yeah, I think that the question of humor is a really interesting one. Um, and like Tatiana said, you know, Ukraine, modern Ukrainian literature starts, starts from basically a kind of joke. You know, it's uh, the fact that you take the classical texts, the, the Aeneid, and you replace the Trojans with these Cossacks who are you know, going, going on various escapades and drinking, and, you know, um, it's, it's pretty funny. Uh, Aeneas is obviously, it's, it's, very, it's very much a travesty. The, the main character is really kind of under, constantly undermined and, and, and shown as, uh, as, as, as kind of sort of lovable and admirable, but also ridiculous. Um, and that, that goes right through Ukrainian culture. It goes, I mean, without Kotlerevsky, there wouldn't be Gogol. You know, and if you read Gogol's Ukrainian stories, he has epigraphs taken from Kotlerevsky. Uh, his father was, Gogol's father was a Ukrainian language writer who was basically copying Kotlerevsky. So, you know, Gogol comes out of this 
this tradition, which also has its, its own links to like the Cossack culture and the, and the Baroque culture uh, and all of that stuff. You know. So there's, there's that kind of genealogy. Um, but also, you know, if you look at the um, Ukrainian literature of the 1920s, a lot of it's, it's, it's very funny. Um, like Nikola Kovish and Mr. Vishnya, and a lot, a lot of it's, it's it, and, and it's all often that humor is about um, it's a it's about the, the the kind of the small people standing up against power and using and using humor as a weapon. You know, even in in, in Ida, the, the the characters who are kind of defying the gods in some ways. Um, and in Google stories, you see the Cossacks coming and confronting Catherine II in her palace. You know, this is a very, very funny and very interesting scene. Um, even if you think of like the, um, the the letter of the Cossacks to the the, the Sultan, the, the Ottoman Sultan, which is the subject of a very famous painting by Repin. Um, you see, you know, you've probably seen it. There's this group of Cossacks writing this letter, this very, very, and it's a real letter that was written to the Turkish, Turkish Sultan. It was extremely obscene, extremely funny. Um, you know, so that kind of total ir irreverence and lack of respect for authority has been there all, all through Ukrainian culture, and it's it's something that, you know, it, it's interesting that Gogol is the one who brings humor into Russian culture because it wasn't coming from from Russian literature. <laughs> um, yeah, and you see it, and even you know, if you even look at if you look at like sort of like Zelensky, what he was doing before he became president, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the sort of thing that you, you know, it's really, really just so typical of Ukrainians, the way they, they their attitude towards the people who rule them, as if that's even possible, um, and you know, in such a contrast again, you know, to, doesn't want to always define it in, in, in contrast with Russia, but you can't imagine that. That program, that that show, that the seven people coming out of Russia. May I just reflect yeah. on that because it just reminded me of uh, my uh, of an anecdote from my own life. Because um, um, I had a friend whose mom was from Russia, and she came to visit my grandparents in the west of Ukraine. And on the second day, I think, of her stay, she asked me, why are they always joking? And she, thought, she thought that my grandparents were joking to each other, but they were just speaking that way, you know? Like, they weren't joking on purpose. That was just like, the type of communication we had. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I guess humor is one of our main strengths of the um, Just the last question before I give the audience the ability to address our speakers. Um, so. Maybe it's less related to uh, fear, but more about de decolonization and uh, uh, why was Ukrainian culture overlooked all these years? By all these years, I mean maybe, well, certainly during the Russian Empire or during the Soviet Union, but maybe even during the last couple of decades. Um, and what should the West, if anything, do to decolonize those visions of Ukrainian art, Ukrainian culture? Um, well, first of all, um, not only the West has to decolonize, because decoloniality doesn't belong to anyone, but everyone has the right to decoloniality, and we all have to do it, and one day even Russia will do it, eventually it will be there as well. Um, we do a lot of we do have a lot of homework in Ukraine as well regarding that because we still struggle from this kind of post-colonial feeling and we still have to emancipate ourselves from this. We still have to learn about ourselves. We have to open our archives, publish them, research them. Um, we have to you know bring back all the uh, names and um, phenomena out of the shadow where they were intentionally thrown into because that's, that was an intentional policy for, for, for decades to erase and you know to kind of disrupt that process of cultural development. Um, even the, um, the history of Ukrainian culture was a subject which was forbidden as actually any other um, uh, <coughs> 
countries, any other cultures in the frame of the empire. Um, Ukraine was only able to write its own art history uh, after the Second World War, during the very short period of thaw, and that was a kind of a window of opportunity they took. And that's why we have our own art history written down while, let's say, Georgians or Uzbekistan or Tajik don't have that until now. Um, so first of all, we, you know, we were overlooked because we ourselves didn't have the, uh, um, the access to this history, to the archives. Archives were closed in Ukraine until the collapse of the Soviet Union plus several years. Um, and you know, only slowly <coughs> we started to open them until you know, everything was accessible. Although, that's interesting, a lot of important archives and manuscripts that relate to Ukrainian culture are in Russia, and we will never probably have access to them, well, until, you know, Russia is decolonized or collapsed. So, I mean, we will always um, be kind of dependent on the empire because they still owe, physically owe some of our archives, of a part of our history that we need to, you know, re uh, take back and um, have in our possession. And of course, you know, when there is no uh, knowledge about our, ourselves, there is no process of producing this knowledge about our own history and culture, how come someone else can have access to that? I mean, how the West was supposed to know about Ukrainian culture when we didn't know about it. When there was something done by the dia diasporas and there was actually the Ukrainian studies done outside of Ukraine, thanks to those people who, had, who, who left the country and who were able to preserve some knowledge and they, they, they produced some knowledge uh, on Ukraine. But actually because it was overlooked because of this imperial uh, policy against Ukraine and now that's the time to decolonize. That's why, for example, we at the Ukrainian Institute emphasize the necessity to do so. We have different programs and approaches how to um, uh, how to help different institutions and people work with it, museums, academics, uh, ac academia, um, you know, artistic process. So, uh, but yeah, lots of, uh, lots of work has to be done um, at home. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I think the, the reason why uh, Ukrainian culture hasn't really been perceived in the West is to do, I mean, it's to do with many factors, but one of them is certainly the way that our own view of culture is a product of hierarchies of power based in, 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 in empire and in imperialism and colonialism, basically. Um, you know, if you think about the way that um, English language culture is seen in the UK in relation to the former empire, that was also the, cult the, the civilizing culture, the high culture, the language that everyone in the colonies had to learn. Um, you know, it's why we have many writers from uh, former British colonies writing in the English language, and the same way that Google wrote in Russian. Um, and we didn't, we never valued the, the languages from those places and the cultures of those places and, unless they could you know, convert themselves and integrate themselves into the culture of the, of the metropole. Um, and that continues to this day, you know, how, how many people, you know, how many British people can name a Caribbean writer, for example? Mm -hmm. Maybe Derek Walcott, yeah, I don't know. Um, so we, we, we understand and we have understood culture in those terms for a long, long time. And when we look at other contexts, other cultural, cultural contexts, we've looked at them in the same way. We've respected the powerful culture of the metropole. So the French culture and the, and the Russian culture, you know, because well, if this is a language and a culture that's attached to a big, cult, big powerful empire, well, it must be worthy of respect, yeah. Which is, when you think about it, is not really a criterion for ju judging how good X novel is or X poem is, yeah. But but this is this is why you know when we think of classics of, of literature, we think of you know Goethe, we think of Victor Hugo, we think of Dostoevsky. And we don't think of an Albanian writer or a Ukrainian writer, um, you know, or an Algerian writer, and so on. So it's you know it's related to our own uh, the colonial hierarchies of culture that have shaped our own ways of seeing things. Um, 
and we just we, we just haven't been able to perceive the fact that there might be something interesting culturally happening in Ukraine. We haven't taught it. We haven't taught the language so that there could be a person who might be able to translate that literature into English for people to read. Because it's just seen as like, what's, what's the point? We need to translate the great culture, you know, Dostoevsky. So we have a thousand translations of Dostoevsky, but you know, there are still no translations of a lot of this Ukrainian work, for example. Still On that today. note, I just want to thank William because he has produced so many translations from Ukrainian to English for the English audiences to read. Um, but if you're interested in Les Ukrainka, there was a very good project run by the London Ukrainian Institute. Uh, there was a translation prize the last year that they held, and a, you know, a competition that they held for translating our work. So if you go onto their website, you'll be able to find uh, some, some really nice new translations of, of our work. Which we'll add it to the follow-up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, <it's, laughs> yeah, but it's literally you know, something that's just happening now. Okay, so we're ready to Fargo. <laughs> no, thank you both so much for such wonderful presentations. Um, mine is more of a comment that will, I hope, will kind of trigger a wider discussion because, you know, we've talked about Shevchenko, we've talked about Ukrainian art. So, uh, one, like from my research recently, I was looking at actually um, the Piridvizhniki or the itinerants or wonders, how they're known in English. Um, and what I came across is, of course, the Tritikov Gallery in Moscow, which was founded by um, uh, Pavel Tritikov, who was a quite a famous uh, Moscow art collector and art patron. And recent uh, scholarship has proven that he was like an ardent uh, Slavophile uh, and quite uh, nationalistic. But uh, one of the most fascinating things is that he commissioned a portrait of Taras Shevchenko. 10 years after Shevchenko died. Um, and that portrait is still in the Tritikov Gallery and is presented as a portrait of a great and prominent Russian um, uh, cultural kind of figure. Um, and I actually checked recently and like to this day on their website, that portrait is presented as of a Russian prominent cultural figure. And so kind of I, you know, I'm still quite, I don't understand, you know, in the sense that Shevchenko was exiled for 10 years, partially because of his anti-Tsarist, anti-imperial kind of commentary. And yet we have this very prominent, you know, art collector commissioning his portrait and putting it in one of the most famous galleries, uh, considered like a, one of the first national art museums of Russia. And, you know, I'm really, I'm just kind of confused by it. So maybe you can comment more about like how this dynamic makes sense, because, you know, we've discussed this idea of like erasure by destruction or appropriation and the internal conflict between those two, but I don't know, this is just, I don't understand how that can still make sense. Yeah, I think it's kind of, well, we started to discuss this dissonance between Russia destroying and executing or censoring Ukrainian culture and in the same time appropriating it and calling it Russia. If you look at uh, many Ukraine, Ukraine board and Ukrainian uh, artists or writers, and you go on the Russian Wikipedia page, it will say Russian, just because it was during the Russian Empire. Most of them, well, Tatiana would obviously have a lot, well, and William to, to mention many artists, like in the avant-garde, for example, in Malevich, Axel Bulak, there's a lot. Don't read Wikipedia. <laughs> Don't read it. <laughs> or read the Ukrainian one. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I, I, I frankly don't know that case, and I don't know, um, it's interesting, who is who's the author of that um, portrait? Do you, do you have the name? Yeah, yeah, Kronskoy, Kronskoy. Kronskoy. So he's the founder of the Wikipedia. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, I still am not sure, I would need to research more, but my first thought would be um, the Wikipedia were kind of this first um, move to the people, uh, you know, to go mm -hmm. into the people mm -hmm. and get to know the people. And this was something that also uh, uh, Shevchenko was doing in Ukraine with Narodnitsko, yeah. So they were kind of sim had similar um, approach, similar this uh, political, let's say, political views. So maybe that was the reason with, where, where he had some kind of empathy and interest in Shevchenko, but maybe William knows more. Yeah, I actually, I also didn't know this, but um, yeah, I think that. It's, it's important to remember that 
the Ukrainian cultural figures working in the Russian Empire, they're working in the same intellectual um, field as the Russian intellectuals. They are often going to the same salons, they're often in the same journals, they know each other. Um, the attitude from the state is one thing, the attitude from the kind of Russian cultural uh, establishment is, can be slightly different. Um, often in relation to Ukrainian culture, there's, you can get some kind of like hostility. Um, sometimes it's this kind of paternalistic, um, uh, almost kind of affection for these writers. Um, sometimes it's respectful, sometimes it's admiration. You know, so it's, it, you, you can't reduce the, the kind of it to one single attitude amongst mm -hmm. Russian intellectuals towards Ukrainian intellectuals. Uh, generally, it's it's not the happiest story, but it's kind of you know, there are, there are very variations within it. Um, and Slavophilism as well. You know, the, the, these are ideas that U Ukrainian intellectuals were interested in, but they they saw it in a, I guess in a in a slightly different way to the Russian version of it. When the Russian version of it was everything obviously like flows into the Russian River, all of these small Slavic. Um, nations um, and everything you know, kind of revolves around Russia. Um, the Ukrainians, you know, they also saw themselves as potentially at the center of a kind of, you know, coalition of Slavic nations. But but because the Ukrainians are the ones who can fight for freedom, because they are the most oppressed, they they should be like kind of at the center of it and the leaders of it. Um, you know, and if you go to the Slovaks, they also have kind of similar. Um, and, but then the Ukrainians were also like very much plugged into like what the Poles were saying and what the Czechs and the Slovaks were saying, probably more than the Russians would have been as well, because they're because they're, they're, they're kind of in this in between position. But you know, so, so someone who's a Slavophile in Russia might have looked at Shevchenko and potentially seen certain, um, yeah, found certain echoes in, in his work. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. I don't know about this specific. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> if you could just. Uh, tell us uh, in short who you are, your name. Uh, yeah, my name is Anna, and just yesterday I submitted my master's thesis. So uh, I'm yesterday a student at the CSUCL. Uh, yeah, I have so many questions to you. And uh, first of all, massive thanks to both of you for the work for Ukrainian culture and for translations and for decolonizing it for Western audience. And uh, yeah, I have two questions and one observation uh, to share with you um, about Shuchenko. Uh, basically, I, I submitted, I, I mentioned Shuchenko in my thesis, and I mentioned, I examined in my thesis how uh, Russian proxy governments in Eastern Ukraine reshaping public space, how they like installing new figures and uh, erasing uh, figures that no longer fit into this new mythology. And I was actually kind of surprised to, to find out uh, that Shevchenko um, is being erased because, as uh, you mentioned, William, uh, like it was kind of incorporated into Soviet culture by reinventing him as a proletarian voice, as an anti-Tsarist voice. So it was pretty easy to re it would be pretty easy to reinvent him like as a part of Russian culture. Uh, but uh, his figure is kind of being erased, uh, like he, uh, some educational institutions that was named after him, uh, they have been renamed into some Russian or local figures, uh, and uh, there are like initiatives uh, to remove his monuments uh, from central parts uh, of the city. Uh, I'm particularly talking about uh, Luhansk, uh, and one of my suggestions, uh, why they're doing so, uh, like two suggestions. First of all, because like Ukraine was pretty successful in uh, uh, demystifying, demystifying, thank you, uh, his figure, like uh, presenting him as a true like uh, uh, national Ukrainian voice. And the second, uh, in terms of uh, symbolic sense and in terms of the monument as symbolic place, um, pro-Ukrainian protests uh, in spring uh, in 2014, uh, they. Uh, were held near Shevchenko's monuments. So actually it was like realm of memory for people, uh, mm -hmm. for locals who live there. Like it's like, if you want to uh, make pro-Ukrainian protests, probably you can gather near Shevchenko's monument. Uh, to compare like uh, pro-Russian protests, they usually held near Lenin's monuments. 
Uh, so it, it's also kind of symbolic thing. So yeah, it was uh, one finding uh, that I wanted to share with you that Shevchenko is being excluded uh, currently uh, from the occupied territories. And the second, uh, I have like, okay, I'll, I'll start with one question. Uh, probably, but uh, I will have time for another one. Uh, you were telling about how we should like decolonize Ukrainian culture um, in terms of like, communicating about it, in terms of explanation, trying to like to make this uh, uh, clear, distinguish uh, between uh, Russian and Ukrainian voices. And my question would be a practical one. Uh, we know all these stories about Russians practically stealing Ukrainian cultural objects uh, from the occupied territories. We know that they stole Skisian gold uh, from Melitopol uh, Museum. We know that they are stealing everything, like uh, from stole everything from Kherson museums. Uh, yeah, basically, my question: What to do with that? Because they are not going to recognize ever that like they stole some objects, some items from Ukrainian museums, and they. Uh, will not be very eager to return them back uh, even if Russia collapses, because uh, we had this experience like probably from the Soviet Union. We also uh, know that a lot of uh, Ukrainian objects uh, have been stolen from Ukrainian museums and transferred to Russia, and they're still in Russia. And like, um, I wouldn't say that there was a major discussion like we should return them back. Uh, so yeah, like probably it's very. Um, <laughs> Philosophical question, but uh, what what to do? How to return all these objects that have been moved to Russia? <coughs> well, it's a very practical question. I have to say, <laughs> it's very practical in sense that it's the matter of the criminal. Um, um, sorry, I forgot the word. Case. Uh, like process. Process. Yeah, because these are war crimes. I mean, you cannot just like steal uh, art steal anything, you know, and just get away with it. No, uh, there, is, there is police, there are acts of cr crime being uh, committed. And for each of these cases that were mentioned in the video, like these hundreds of cases of ruined or destroyed or damaged or looted art, there is a criminal case. And it's going to be preceded and, you know, eventually, at some point, someone has to be responsible for that. Um, it's interesting how your question refers to the experience I had yesterday. I did a workshop for the Victoria and Albert Museum staff, for their curators, and we, we looked at the objects that they have in their collection. These are, these are two gates from the church in Kipichers Club, and maybe you know the, the, the objects. So they have two, two, two of them. And it's interesting because they, um, they see these objects in the frame of the Nazi looting from this World War II because um, during the World War II, these objects that belong to one of the famous Jewish um, antique um, collector and antique uh, uh, store, yeah, they were looted by Nazis and then resold, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, VNA never looked before the Nazis, so they, they never questioned what was the origins of these gates before the 30s. And when I told them that it was actually looted by the Bolsheviks from Kipichers Klavra either in the late 20s or early 30s, when they just killed the, mon the monks and just destroyed everything ruined and sold everything that could be sell sold through Torxin, uh, 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 they were very surprised and a little bit of, I think, a little even scared because, you know, when I told them it was looted originally, you know, in the 20s. They were like, oh my gosh, what do, do we, we have do to give this back? Yeah, I mean, like, do we have to give it back now? That was exactly the question in their eyes. I mean, because that's the question, because it's as, uh, as, as white, you know, and it really concerns the whole century of lootings in Ukraine, because it was looted by the Soviets in the 20s, by the Soviets in the 30s, by the Germans in the 40s, by the Soviets in the 40s, and now again. So it's like, you know, at least the fifth time in one century that our museums, our art collections, and cultural objects were just, you know, looted and destroyed. Um, I don't, um, I don't agree that nothing was done before. Um, there was a special person responsible, the Minister of Culture for Restitution. That's the term for it, because um, um, every museum has, you know, a, a collection 
uh, records and they know exactly what artworks were there. For example, the famous case of the Kranach um, uh, paintings from the Hanamka museums, you know, which no one knows exactly you know, what happened. Now they already know that it was looted in the 20s by the Bolsheviks, but they just didn't keep the record and they just sold them somewhere. So they eventually ended up being in Spain. And that's also a question, like, you know, what these new owners have to do because they actually paid for them to the Soviet, eventually to the Soviet government. Yeah, but the Soviet government just looted them from, from the collection. So I mean, there are many cases like that and they were recorded. There was certain process of negotiation and certain process of um, a communication about these things. Certain objects were even returned if there was a will of those uh, current or owners, but the majority were not, of course. Um, but I have to say that it's a very delicate uh, issue, which is very delicate to deal with, and in the diplomatic um, circles, and as I'm I, I work with the institution affiliated with the Minister of Foreign uh, Affairs, I know how you know, carefully that things, that, that dialogue is handled. And with certain countries, for example, like Germany, this dialogue doesn't exist at all because Germany still has like hundreds, if not thousands of objects from Ukrainian museums and they just don't want to return them. I mean, there's, and you know, Germany is so important for, for contemporary Ukrainian politics that Ukraine doesn't want to kind of, you know, ruin the relationship with Germany for just paintings, you know. So like, I mean, that's something that will have this, dialogue somewhere, some, some, sometime later on. Um, but the lootings that are happening now, I mean, since the 2014 invasion, they are recorded. There are certain people in certain institutions, in police, in the SBU, in Procuratura, etc., that are recording everything. They collect the evidence, they are going to court, and this will be the case of the criminal procedure. Um, um, I know that there was a huge quick case uh, when this year the Hermitage director was um, um, happy to say that they have sent five million archaeology, uh, archaeological objects from Crimea uh, in the past eight years. So these were illegal excavations in Crimea of five million archaeological objects. We're here in the archaeology department. You know, you know what that means. You know. It's, it's a huge amount. I mean, these are layers of culture that were illegally uh, taken away, and we don't have the records of them, you know, but we just know the number and like some things that were already in public, uh, public sphere. But that, that will be like a difficult case to recognize these five million objects and to return them. But the rest from the museums, etc., they're really well uh, identified, you know, so it's, it's, it's possible to, back, to bring them back. And for example, uh, there are, um, in, in, inside the museum community, there are some instruments to prevent these things from being sold again to the West, you know, or elsewhere, or to the global South, whatever, because there is a red list, which is a, a list of objects that were looted, and it's um, spread, it's a public information, it's, a, it's like a, a record, actually, the, the, the journal of these objects. And it's uh, available to all the community, and that's the kind of the uh, instrument you have to um, um, consult before you uh, acquire anything to your collection, because you know, in case it might be looted. And these red lists they exist for all the countries and cases of conflict, and the ICOM, the International ICOM Organization, is responsible for uh, uh, collecting it. Thank you. Maybe I'll. Shall I go to your first question, or do you want to go to the other first? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not surprised that the authorities of the LNR are, are doing that um, because probably those people who are in charge of whatever cultural policy they have are not very smart. Um, well, I mean, I think the cadres of the LNR are probably very kind of, you know, of a poor thought. Um, but, the, you know, the, the, the people running the Soviet cultural policy were probably a bit smarter, more sophisticated, or, or even the Russian imperial. Um, because you don't have to just destroy, you don't have to just remove and, and take things away. Um, you know, we, we already touched on that, but you can do various different things to kind of um, undermine or sort of neutralize culture. Um, you know, so if you think about this image of Ukrainian culture was sort of reduced to this, it's kind of folklore, 
it's traditions, it's things from the past, it's kind of museified. It's not like a living contemporary culture. It's something that's like, it's in the past, which we can kind of look at in a museum, or we can, you know, we can kind of study, but it, it, it's, it's, it's not alive, it's not connected to some kind of community, or some kind of, you know, uh, a society, or political community, or political ideas that, that, can, that can live and that can, that can continue to, um, to grow and develop and change and, and be modern. So this is why, you know, when, when Mesut Krink is writing modernist dramas, which are based on her reading of all the latest like, European modern dramas, this is like a threat um, to what Russia is trying to, trying to turn Ukrainian culture into. into. Um, and if you think about, you know, what, what did we do with the cultures of the, you know, the, the British Empire's African or Asian cultures? We museified it, you know, we, we took the stuff and we put it into our museums. And we turned it into something that's just an object, it, it, this is all in the past. Uh, these, whatever civilizations might have been there, there in the past, and now we will look after these things for them because they can't look after it themselves. Um, and this is this is a way of kind of neutralizing and kind of killing off that culture. Um, so you can do it without destroying it entirely. Um, with the, with the sort of Shevchenko and the Soviet Union, it's it's kind of something similar, but it's also changing the image of, of Shevchenko as well. It's because there's also here there's a question of what's the reaction going to be if we destroy this, uh, you know, this, this culture that we are colonizing. Um, well, they could be, you know, talking about fear, they could be afraid of the reaction. Um, so maybe we can't go that far, maybe we have to be more careful. So let's keep it, but let's, but let's kind of try to control it. Um, let's, let's alter the image into something that's still there, we, you can still have it, we didn't destroy it, but we're going to change the meaning of it a little bit to make it less threatening. Um, and I think that, that, that's what happened in the Soviet Union, but still it's, very, it's a very, very uneasy relationship. You know, and you know, Shevchenko monuments in the Soviet Union were, were, were places where people, which people would use in the Soviet times, like the Kiev, the Kiev one next to the university. People would come there on anniversaries related to Shevchenko's life and gather, and the KGB would be watching who's there. Um, you know, so they, were, they had that monument there because they knew, well, we can't just completely erase this. We'll try and control the image, but it was always this kind of thing that was ready to be like reactivated, um, and that happened. And, and those a lot of the monuments in Ukraine today that people gather at their Soviet monuments, like the Haki one that I showed. You know, um, but monuments are things that you can reinvest with meanings as many, basically as many times as you like. You know? So it's, yeah, it's, that's my comment. Um. How, how would you take this uh, conversation to, to the East um, in, a, in a way which doesn't alienate the East? What I'm, what I'm saying is that there I notice a lot of reference to the West, to European culture. Um, so how would, you, how would you put that to an Eastern, like globally Eastern audience, without referring to just what's happening in Europe, that Europe has to act in a certain way or things happened in Europe. Same the things have happened globally, you know. And other nations have also gone through decolonization. I think it's it's a really good question. Um, I mean one of the one of the things that Russia is trying to do at the moment is kind of speak to the global south and present itself as the opposite to the legacy of Western colonialism, um, and this is why there's, there, there is a certain ambiguity in, like in the global south towards supporting Ukraine, because Ukraine is supported by the West, yeah, which, which has the, the, this legacy of, of colonialism. You can, you can certainly understand you know, the logic. Um, but I think what, um, you know, what Ukraine can do is you know, talk, about, talk about itself as a, as, as a country which is going through a process of decolonization. Um, you know, there's, there's actually, there's a very rich history and a rich culture which, whereby, you know, solidarities could be established with countries in the global south, with, with those who were the victims of 
British and French, uh, etc., imperialism, because um, there are so many parallels. You know, so I think what you know a really great thing would be cultural diplomacy with between Ukraine and those countries to kind of to, kind of, to, to start those conversations and say, well, you know, in, in this equation, like Russia is, is not necessarily your friend because it's the enemy of the West, but actually it's just another empire which was competing with those empires. And it's, you know, it's not a force for good and it's not a force against imperialism in the world at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And Ukraine is in the same position as, like, as you guys were. Um, but that's a, it's a difficult thing to get across. Um, does Ukraine have the resources to do it, you know, to stretch itself when it's really focused? It has to focus its cultural diplomacy and all, all other kinds of diplomacy on the West, because that's where the help is coming from. But still, I think it would be a, it would be a useful thing to do. Um, well, it's, <coughs> it's not just a, a useful idea, but it's a, a practical uh, a task, actually, we have, for example, from, um, from the government of Ukraine, which understands the necessity to speak to the global east or the south, whatever you call it. Um, because it's one of our um, actually colonial legacies that we were not able to have this direct dialogue with the eastern, let's say, southern part of the world, because it was the metropole that had it. Actually, it was always through the metropole that we had any kind of connection to anyone. But it's just that we still remember the direct connection to the West better than the rest of the world from those periods when we had this experience of a sovereign statehood, yeah, from early 20th century or before that from Hetmanat, from the Cossacks time. Um, and, uh, and also, yeah, there were certain uh, diasporas that were established mostly in the Western world that were kind of keeping this idea of the sovereign Ukraine and would, you know, throw the woods in this fire um, and raise awareness in those countries where they were uh, based. Canada, United States, Western Europe mostly. Um, so we don't have really experience of talking directly to the global east or the global south, <coughs> but we understand how important it is to establish, that, to establish it and to start talking. And what we definitely can say is that we understand you because we, are, we have that experience. We were colonized, we were suffering this imperial oppression the same way as you did, you know, and we are trying to make our way out of it, out of this trauma, you know, we, we, we try to recover, we try to fight back the empire, and this is what successes we have, this is our the lessons that we are, you know, able and willing to share, and these are our kind of mistakes and um, uh, flaws, and we need help from, you know, you, from the bad, good experiences and good practices that you have. So I mean that's kind of the, the, the context and the way of approaching that we see for ourselves. But as we um, noticed, the resources that are needed to start talking and start having this dialogue are just enormous. And the, the struggle now is like where to find them, you know, because you know you need people and hours and projects, like something to 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 fill in this communication. You cannot just like, speak in the clouds, you know, you have to be here in the room, sitting with lights on, with the screen, uh, with the audience, in order to start a dialogue to have it. So it's a very important, good question, and uh, it's a practical task that we have, uh, and the government of Ukraine actually is um, working on this, and maybe you've heard that there was the first African tour of the Minister of the Foreign Affairs, Nikola Dmitro Kuleva, sorry. And it was for the first time in our 30 years of history. Yep. Uh, my question is more about the future, because we've seen now for eight years Russia effectively destroying any kind of Ukrainian culture in the occupied territories. I'm speaking about Donbass and Crimea, of course. And uh, once we do liberate and begin reintegration of those territories into Ukraine, there will be a generation of children who never lived under Ukraine and were, you know, brought up in this ideology of Ruskimir. So my question is, how should the Ukrainian state approach this issue? Because there will obviously be a lot of division because of that. How should we approach it, and what kind of solutions are there? 
Well, it's not just Ukrainian culture that was, was destroyed in these occupied territories, but also Crimean Tatar, Greek, German, all other cultures, you know, that were always in Ukraine because Ukraine was always multi-ethnic, multicultural, diverse country. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I mean, the way is definitely um, education, um, context, uh, you know, we need, um, unlike the empire, we don't want to force, you know, but we want to provide the choice and provide the ways to, uh, to learn, to know, um, and to build their own identity and way out, because, you know, it's also a process of trauma for those people who, have, who will have to reinvent themselves, who will have to refuse from their own um, beliefs, ideas, stereotypes, and start from the scratch, you know, understanding the world, you know, differently. It, it, it's, a, it's, a diff it, it's a very difficult thing. Um, the conversation about kind of tying back the country or bringing back the country has started, I mean, in 2014, I think, right after the occupation. How are we going to live together after, you know, after we're, you know, back in the same country? And, um, um, I mean, it will definitely take a long time and a lot of effort and a lot of dialogue and, uh, um, yeah, just approaches to understand each other, you know, not to, um, not to blame, try not to blame and understand and just give a choice. Yeah, it's, it's a really, really difficult question. Um, I don't know if I have, have an answer to it, but I think that one of, one of the problems that Ukraine's had after 1991 was that for a long time it didn't put enough resources into developing and promoting Ukrainian culture inside Ukraine. You know, we're, we're kind of talking about the view of the West or our cultural diplomacy, but um, you know, for a long time you had governments in Ukraine which were really not interested in doing that. Um, which, and even, even we're, we're quite in interested in doing the opposite. You know, if you look at the sort of things that um, Mikhail Azarov was, was saying when, when he was in power about you know, uh, Ukrainian culture, that you, know, you basically have like Ukrainian ministers <coughs> of education and culture who openly just denigrate Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian language and say that everybody should be reading Russian, Russian literature. Um, and it's only really after after Maidan, after 2014, that you you get this kind of explosion of these new institutions, and like the Ukrainian Institute is one of them, which were which are, are not only working like with, with uh, promoting Ukraine abroad, but, but kind of doing interesting stuff with Ukrainian culture inside Ukraine, um, and changing the way that it's presented and the way that it's kind of sold to people and the way that it's taught. Um, you know, you mentioned how you, how you learned Ukrainian literature in the 1990s. Like, lots of people say this, you know, it just wasn't attractive to us because of the way it was taught. And I think that now that that was changing, you know, in the last few years, and now, like, with the war, it's obviously it's very difficult with resources and so on, but to keep supporting these institutions, but that's, that's a really, really important thing. And those institutions are going to be really important going forward, um, I think. Well, I mean, I mean um, there was this period when Yushchenko was the president, like early 2000s, yeah. there was another kind of cultural, um, the, the moment when culture was important and prioritized, and there was the moment when there were attempts to start this institution. Actually, uh, many of these newly established institutions that were um, um, found uh, after the revolution of dignity, their idea was born in the early 20s back then, so it took you know, almost 10 years to kind of, you know, for the pregnancy period, you know, until they were actually born after 2014. Uh, but yeah, I mean, those pro-Russian governments, we're speaking about pro-Russian governments of Yanukovych or Kuchma, which, which was also, I mean, they didn't pay attention to culture as uh, continuing this Soviet tradition of um, culture as something not significant, not important, something decorative, something, you know, just like um, something to put on the wall that it looks nice, uh, but not having culture as uh